Hi, everyone. So, yes, we're totally shifting gears now. And today, I am going to talk to you about aging. But before I start, I'm going to, well, I'm going to actually start with a bit of a perhaps controversial quote here, which I'm going to make a statement and say that within our lives, we will take drugs to actually slow our rate of aging. So I'll, I'll just say that again. Within our lives in this room, we will take drugs to actually slow our rate of aging. Now, why, why would I stand on stage in front of all you guys and sort of say something so crazy that is probably a completely new idea for, for everyone sitting here? Because it does sound kind of crazy to have this pill that you could take to slow aging. But the truth is, this is actually what I do. This is actually my job. So I am a scientist, and I specialize in the science of aging, or more specifically, the science of why we age at a cellular level, and why we actually start to get sicker as we get older, and why we come, become more frail and generally start to fall apart a bit as we get older. And that is what I've done for the last seven years. I have worked in drug development, actually developing drugs and supplements and topicals that will actually slow the rate at which our cells age. So I know what you're thinking. OK, we've heard this all before. Absolute snake oil, rubbish. We've heard of magic lotions and potions that you know, give us all this promise but don't actually work. And I have to be completely honest, if somebody had come on stage and told me 10 years ago, even though I'm a scientist, that we'd be able to slow our rate of aging, I would have said exactly the same thing. Because, you know, you can't. You know, that's what I would have thought. But the truth is, there's actually been some huge developments within our field in the last 10 years that have not only let us understand like why we are actually aging, but also that aging isn't this fixed thing. Just as we know we can speed up aging, we now know that we can actually slow down aging as well. And this is what I'm going to talk to you all about. But first of all, aging, this word, OK? What does it actually mean? Like, if you think about it, how would you actually define it? And it, it kind of gets a bit difficult, because it kind of depends who you ask. Because I guess if you ask a child, you know, you'd probably go, oh, I want to get older, I want to grow up. It sounds like it's a great thing to get a bit older. However, if you ask someone that's maybe 49, they might not be so optimistic about putting that extra candle on the birthday cake. Uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of a hard thing. But when you, get, when, you get, when you say to people, but what is it? Like, what is happening? People start to go, well, you know, it's this inevitable thing. It's this natural thing that you just can't stop. It's the march of time. You kind of get a bit of a wishy-washy definition. Y you know, it's hard to put a real point on. But what is, ac what is actually aging? What is it? So because I'm a scientist, I like to explain what aging is in scientific terms. So scientifically, what is actually going on within our bodies that is actually causing aging or the signs and symptoms that we associate with aging to actually happen. So we're going to do a bit of a science lesson, OK? So bear with me here. So your life purpose is to pass on your DNA. So I'm really sorry for everyone who thought the life purpose was to be an artist or a scientist or a doctor or whatever. It's actually not. At least in evolutionary terms, your life purpose is to carry your DNA and pass it on to your children, essentially. So our bodies are kind of like designed as a bit of a shell to protect our DNA, to make sure that we get to reproductive age and we can pass on our DNA in one piece. But the problem is that life is actually really destructive. So every day, things are trying to damage our bodies and damage our DNA. So you've got, you know, just by breathing, you're actually damaging your DNA because you get free radicals, which are hitting it and damaging it all the time. Then you've got things that we inflict upon ourselves, like poor diet and, and things like that. So what it means is that our bodies have had to evolve to have some really brilliant self-repair mechanisms. And just to put this into perspective, every day it's estimated that you get about 10,000 pieces of DNA damage in your cells, and your cells are just fixing it continuously without you even knowing about it and even become an issue. So they're really, really clever at fixing this damage. But the problem is, to fix this damage, it takes a lot of energy for the cells. So the body kind of says, right, up until reproductive age, it's kind of worth investing this energy into repairing ourselves and actually looking after the body to fulfill the life's purpose. But after childbearing age, why would the body keep investing all this energy in repairing itself when really it should have done its job by now and passed on that DNA? 
So what happens is after childbearing age, all of this repair and maintenance in the cells sort of gets switched off, and then you get damage, and then you get what we see as the signs and symptoms of aging. And this is actually called the disposable soma theory of aging. And your soma is another word for body. And it basically means your body's disposable, which sounds pretty grim. But in scientific terms, that is kind of what aging is. But what does this mean for us? Right, well, look at this life expectancy graph, OK? So back in the 1800s here, we were really lucky to live till age 40. You know, that was a really good, good time <laughs> to get to. And up here, we're now living well into our 80s. And this has happened over a very short time frame. So back in the 1800s here, when we were dying just after childbearing age, we didn't really experience aging. Like, get a, get old age wasn't really a thing, because we never really lived in that period of lives after childbearing age where we didn't have all this repair turned on, because what happened is we died from a tooth abscess or in childbirth or something like that. But now, thanks to improved sanitation and healthcare and everything, we're now living way, way longer. And quite frankly, our bodies haven't evolved or been designed to actually live this long. So we're kind of living in new territory as far as evolution and biology is concerned. So I like to say that we have evolved to be good at being young, but not good at being old. So as far as evolution was concerned, we were never going to reach old age. So why would it make us good at being old? So we're now living these long lifespans, but we don't have the sort of repair and maintenance systems within ourselves to be able to live them well. So these two words, the top one you'll be very familiar with, but I'm going to teach you a little bit about the bottom one, and more importantly, the difference between these two things. So your lifespan is just the number of years you will live, whereas your health span is the number of these years that you will actually live in good health. And this is the important one, and this is the one you have to remember, because what I like to say is your health span is the proportion of your life that you actually live in. You're not suffering from disease, you're, you're, you know, you're independent, you can basically live your life how you want to live your life, and you're not limited. The issue that we've really got now is there's a big discrepancy between our lifespan and our health span. Okay? So to put this into perspective, for a girl born in the UK today, she is expected to live for 83 years. That's her lifespan. But her health span is currently, at current rates, only predicted to actually be to until 64. So this means 23% of her life, or nearly a quarter of her life, is expected to be lived in poor health. And I think we can all probably see this around us from you know, issues in care homes and things like this. this. This is real stats here that we can see happening around us. And the reason for this is because it's very well known now that aging is actually the biggest risk factor for all of the major diseases that we are really suffering. All of the things that drugs companies are actually trying to cure, the biggest risk factor is actually your age. So just to put this into some graphs, because I'm a scientist, Top one, cardiovascular disease. You know, after age 40, it's really starting to go up. The middle one here shows dementia. If you haven't got it by the time you're in your 70s, it's probably on its way. And the last one here, this is cancer. I mean, look at this. Just after your 40s, 50s, post childbearing age, your risk just goes up. And I'm really sorry because they're not good stats that probably people in this room don't want to be hearing. But actually, putting on years is one of the worst things you can actually do for your health. <laughs> now, the thing is, aging's inevitable, isn't it? It's this natural process, you can't do anything about it, you know the way it is. This is our life trajectory. We're born, we learn, we earn, we retire, and then we expire. And that's what we just accept is going to happen. But what happens if you could actually slow, stop, or even reverse aging? How would that change things? How would people feel about that? Would that mean we could live these longer lifespans that we now have, but in good health, improve our health span? So this is exactly what scientists like myself started to say. They said, OK, let's look at the way we approach aging at the minute. And the way we do that is we've got all of these age-related diseases, we research them all individually, and we treat them all individually. And quite frankly, that isn't working, because at current rates, we're expected to live for about 20 years in poor health. So this really needs to change. 
because it's having a huge socioeconomic impact that we can see all around us, and this is only going to get worse. So by 2030, one in five people in the UK will be aged 65 and above. So in other words, out of their period of health span. Okay? And the more worryingly, worrying bit is that the fastest growing portion of our population at the moment is actually 85 plus. And we all know 85 plus are going to have multiple health related issues. And just looking at aging as a whole, the amount of suffering that it actually causes, worldwide there are 150,000 deaths per day, and of these it's estimated that 100,000 are actually age related. So, and we know that people just don't just suddenly drop off the perch from aging. This is like years before this of suffering of age related diseases before they actually die. And on top of this, there's all the things that aren't diseases associated with aging, forgetfulness, incontinence, frailty, and they're not even considered in this sort of stats. So scientists said, well, let's look at this completely differently, OK? So we've got all of these age-related diseases. Aging is kind of the root cause. So therefore, aren't these just symptoms of aging? And if they are, then why don't you treat the root cause and actually treat aging? And if you did this, would it reduce the onset of age-related disease? Would it actually increase health span? And what they have found is that unequivocally, Aging can be, can be slowed, it can actually be, be reversed, and the most important thing is that both of these things improve health span. So the million dollar question, how on earth do you actually slow aging? Now, there have actually been found to be nine different ways scientifically that you can actually slow aging, but I don't have time to go through all of those, so I'm going to go through one that I'm an expert on. And that is a molecule called NAD, which stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, but you don't need to remember that. All you need to remember is that NAD is an incredibly important molecule that you've probably never heard of, but it's so important in your cells that if you didn't have it, you would be literally dead in 30 seconds. And the reason for this is NAD has some really important roles in the body. So first of all, it's a natural molecule that's found in your body and it's in every single cell, and it's incredibly important for cellular energy production. So this is taking your food and turning it into the energy that your cells need to actually just do all of their function and all of the processes. The other thing that it's really important for is cellular repair, and we all know how important cellular repair is. So NAD, when it's high, actually switches on cellular maintenance and repair in the cell and also keeps energy levels high. Now, the issue is, NAD has been found to decline as we get older, and actually quite significantly. So it's estimated that your NAD levels in your cell half every 20 years. So what this means is by the time you're 20, you've already lost half of this critical molecule that you're born with, which is pretty scary considering how important it actually is. Now, if you just look here, you remember I was saying after childbearing age? your repair and maintenance gets switched off. Well, it's no coincidence that after age 40 here, that your NAD is really low. And remember that NAD is what is actually keeping your maintenance and repair switched on, which we know gets switched off after childbearing age. So Sinus said, OK, right, we've got this really important molecule here. And it's declining with age, but it's supposed to be keeping all these good things switched on. So what happens if we just don't let it decline with age? What happens if we keep it high as we get older? Or actually, in older cells, we boost it back up to youthful levels. So this is exactly what they did. And many experiments have now demonstrated that by restoring or maintaining NAD levels, it has a huge host of benefits. Everything from improving cellular energy levels to repairing and looking after that critical DNA, all through to medical type things like improving cognitive function and to actually looking at improved cardiovascular function, insulin resistance, all of these things that actually decline with age. In other words, by restoring NAD levels, it is actually improving your health span, which is what we're all about trying to do. So I'm just going to finish now by going back to that quote I said at the start, which was, within our lifespans, we will actually take drugs to slow our rate of aging. 
And I hope now that you've heard me speak, you might not think that's such a crazy idea and that you understand why scientists like myself are actually seriously looking and researching this because there is a huge amount of research that's going on within our fields at the moment. You only need to Google it to, to get a flavor of how big this could possibly be. I've just put a, a couple of news articles up there that have been there recently. And this means when all of this comes through within our lifetimes, it really is going to change aging as we know it. Thank you. Um, so thank you for that. Super fascinating. And I know you just barely scratch the surface um, of, of everything that's going on, uh, not, not only just obviously in your field, but in the eight other, I think you said, yeah, nine, nine in total. Yep. Yeah. Um, but sticking to your area, I mean, I guess one of the things is, um, could uh, first of all, why did they call it NAD plus as opposed to just NAD? Was it better marketing or something? <laughs> no, oh, <right. laughs> that's, that's science. Okay. Basically, if you Google NAD, sometimes it'll be called NAD plus and sometimes it'll be called NADH. And that's uh, because it, it flips between having different amounts of electrons attached to it. But that's a different presentation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, sk skipping over that. Yeah, skipping um, over that. <laughs> why not just take a, a pill? Uh, can you take NAD as a, like a, a supplement? So the, the problem so, so when all of this was discovered, that was the original thought. Like, right. can we just neck Papa. more NAD? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you, you can't do that. So NAD actually is quite a big molecule in terms of molecule sizes. Okay. And for that reason, the cell actually makes NAD inside the cell. So it's right where it, it's needed to okay. perform these functions. Right. So you can't just directly take NAD, but you can take drugs and supplements and things that are like the building blocks for NAD. So when they go into the body, they go into the cells, and then your cells can use them to make this bigger NAD molecule. OK. And is that, I mean, is that effectively what your company does? Or is it you do you, yeah. you have a, so, right. so the, I, I worked in, in drug development, developing drugs that were designed to, to boost this. But when I was working in drug development, what I seen was that a lot of molecules that actually worked really well weren't drugs. They were natural supplement molecules um, okay. that were actually already approved. Okay. Um, so for me, I was like, okay, the things that people could be doing now and taking now yeah. that actually have good safety behind them that aren't drugs. So I basically started this company to try and get this science out to people quicker with safe and well-known ingredients that are already proven, but drug companies aren't interested in them because they can't patent them. Um, right. Yeah. So is that, is, I mean, is that, is that, I mean, one of the reasons we have, in effect, drug companies, because in, in, in a sense, they present a more uh, potent source of profit, ultimately? U ultimately, for a drugs company, will not take forward any molecule, no matter how well it works, unless they can own it. Right. Um, so what that often means is there's a lot of things that are actually really work really well in the body um, and actually have really good health benefits that don't really get the research they deserve because drugs companies can't own it, therefore they're the ones with the big money that would invest. Right. And they perhaps go for the second or even third best thing right. on the list just so they can actually own it. So it's, a, it's quite a big ethical sort of conversation yeah. in that, actually. Yeah, no, no. I, um well, I'm, I'm, I know there was a, currently there's a big controversy over an Alzheimer's drug that's, that's just been released into the market, I think, mm. um, ab about, it sounds very similar, yeah. where it's effectively, I guess, not necessarily uniformly seen to be a great solution, but yeah. because there's a lot of people desperate to take anything to try and prevent Alzheimer's, there's obviously a, a commercial opportunity to do so. Yeah. Well, listen, I would, we're going to have to do a whole bright ideas <laughs> on, this, on this space. But um, thank you so much. Thanks, Herb. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.